Let's start by looking on some data regarding the importance of currency and checkable deposits across countries and over time. This table shows the ratios of currency to nominal GDP for different countries over time. They are all typically below 20%, most actually below 10%. We see also that in most cases, these ratios decreased over time. This is consistent with our approach at looking at money as a technology. With the emergence of ATM machines, debit and credit cards, the need to carry currency for transaction purposes decreased over time. The next table shows the ratios of M1, that is, the sum of currency and checkable deposits as a fraction of GDP. These form a curious U pattern for this, as they seem to have decreased between 1960 and 1980, and then increased for 2000 to 2012. These correlate well, first, with the expansion of credit after the 60s, and later on with a consistent decrease of interest rates, making it less appealing to hold interest-bearing assets as opposed to currency and checkable deposits. These facts motivate us to develop a framework to analyze the causes and consequences of the demand for money. Let's define money, as we mentioned before, as hand-to-hand -hand currency and checkable deposits. We assume, as it is in reality, that the interest paid on money is zero, as opposed to the ownership of capital and bonds, which have positive returns as interest-bearing assets. The demand for money, now denoted as M superscript D, will be an optimal response to money management. Households need money to make transactions. But there is an opportunity cost for holding money, the interest rate. And turning money into financial assets and back is costly. Note that the higher interest rate provides a greater incentive to hold down average holdings of money, M. This way, one can raise average holdings of interest-bearing assets. That is, with the higher interest rates, households are more willing to incur transaction costs in order to reduce money holdings. We predict, accordingly, that an increase in the interest rate reduces the nominal demand for money. For a given price level P, we can also say that the higher interest rate lowers the real demand for money M superscript D over P. The price level is also a key determinant for the demand of nominal balances. Suppose that the price level changes, say as a consequence of a change in denomination like going from skudos to euros. Then nominal money demand will, cetris paribus, change one to one with the price level nothing changed in the real economy or the interest rate, such that it would motivate you to in need to incur in more transactions. As such, you'd demand the same amount of real balances denoted by M over P. This would be different if the increase would now be on real GDP. Assume the initial plan for money management would be to hold half a month's income on average in the form of money. What would happen if GDP would double while prices kept constant, or, in other words, what would happen if real GDP doubles? Well, if nothing changes in terms of the money management strategy, then households will still be holding half a month's worth of income. But now, that amounts to twice as much money holdings as before. So money demand would increase proportionally. There are reasons, however, to believe that it may not be exactly so. Economies of scale in cash management might prevent the demand for money to increase proportionally with GDP. Transaction costs, that is, the costs that result from having to spend resources in money management, are not likely to increase proportionally with income. So, for higher income levels, it will probably make sense to hold less than a half a month's worth of income. Other reasons that might change the money management strategy include changes in payments technology and in the level of transaction costs. We can then define the real money demand function as a proportional function of the price level, a positive function of real GDP and a negative function of the interest rate. The real demand equation can be found by dividing both sides of the equation by the price level. The left-hand side is now expressed in terms of how many goods can one buy with the money balances M sub superscript D. We just look at the demand for money. 
In terms of supply, let's assume for now that it is exogenously set to some constant M superscript S. The equilibrium in the money market will then, as usual, be given by equating supply and demand. And the price level P will be whatever it needs to be, such that the money market clears. Note that we started by describing the equilibrium business cycle model in terms of four markets, goods, labor, capital, and bonds. We now added the fifth market, the market for money. But we have just four prices, the price for goods, P, the wage rate, W, the rental price of capital, R, and the interest rate, I. However, that is not a problem because we can use Valhazas law. If all markets but one are in equilibrium, then that last market must also be in equilibrium. So if these four prices clear the markets for money, labor, capital, and bonds, it must also be true that the market for goods also clears. This means that supply and demand will equate across all markets, and this situation is referred to as general equilibrium. We can now look more closely at the plot describing supply and demand for money. Like any other supply and demand figure, we will draw the quantity in the x-axis, money in this case, and the price in the y-axis, P. Notice that since we postulated that money supply will just be some exogenous constant M, a prescript S, then it is represented as the vertical line in this figure. We also noted from above that money demand will increase proportionally with the price level, and hence the 45 degree line sloping upwards, denoted by M, a prescript D. The equilibrium price level is given by the intersection of these two schedules, and be equal to P star. You might be confused by the fact that we have an upward sloping demand curve in this figure. But notice that P is not the price of money. Think of a price as what you have to give up to have some quantity of a good. If the good is money, say $1, what you have to give up to hold $1 is precisely whatever that dollar can exchange for in terms of good. So $1 is worth 1 over P goods. And this is precisely the reason why demand is upward sloping, because the y-axis is not the price of money, but its inverse. We can now think of what would happen if the monetary authority were to double money supply. As we can see in the figure, such increase would translate into a rightward shift of the vertical money supply schedule to M upascript S prime, and a movement along the money demand curve to two times P star prime. What would happen to real variables? Since the technology level A has not changed, the real wage rate W over P and labor input L do not change. Therefore, the price level P is twice as high and W over P is unchanged. We conclude that in general equilibrium, the nominal wage rate W has to double. The real rental price R over P and the quantity of capital services kappa times K do not change either. The fixed kappa times K corresponds to a given capital stock K and an unchanged capital utilization rate kappa. We must have, in general equilibrium, that the nominal rental price R doubles. The interest rate I is also unchanged, just as real GDP. This leads to a key result of this setup, the neutrality of money. A change in the level of money supplied influences nominal variables, but not real ones. What would happen if it would be the demand of money changing instead, say, as a consequence of an improvement in the technology for making financial transactions, making the real demand for money holdings to decrease? Such decrease would also lead the price level to go up. This happens because the fall in demand for money shifts the demand curve upwards, and thus an upward movement along the money supply curve and consequently a higher equilibrium price level. Intuitively, a fall in the demand for money means that agents would now rather have their wealth in other instruments, such as bonds, capital, or consumption. This increases the demand for consumption and or investment goods, and therefore the price level. However, unlike in the case of an increase in money supply, a decrease in money demand would likely have real effects. The causes for a decrease in money demand, such as improved transactions technology, would, 
free up resources for increases in real consumption and investment. It is now time also to take a look at the implications that this analysis has for business cycles. Recall the nominal demand for money is given by the following equation. Think about a recession in which real GDP falls. The decline in output reduces the real quantity of money demanded, given by L of Y and I on the right-hand side of this equation. However, we also found that the interest rate tends to fall in a recession. This decreases raises the real quantity of money instead, and thus the overall effect will depend on the relative size effects of changes in real output and the interest rate. Typical estimates indicate that the real quantity of money demanded declines overall in this situation. The fall in interest rates tends to be small, and the real demand for money is not that responsive to these changes. Therefore, we assume that in a recession, the real quantity of money demanded decreases overall and the price level will increase. This will make the price level countercyclical. How does this prediction compare with the data? Looking at data since 1999 for the Eurozone real GDP and the price level, we see that the GDP deflator is overall acyclical. However, if we do not take into account the period of the Great Recession between 07 and 08, the correlation is minus 0.65, as predicted by the theory. Another way to think about this result is to note that in our equilibrium business cycle, shocks come from the supply side. That is, for a given amount of resources, firms are now able to produce less goods and services. This means that the drop in total factor productivity, leading to a recession, makes goods and services to be in low supply, and consequently, their price increases. So far, we assume that the monetary authority does not react to changes in economic activity. However, that is not the case in reality, as monetary authorities have a mandate for promoting price stability and economic activity. Let's focus on the first part of the mandate, price stability. Let's assume that the central bank engages in price level targeting. That is, it aims in intervening by changing money supply to minimize changes in prices. If this would be the case, as prices increase and output falls, the central bank would decrease money supply to stabilize the price level. The extent to which it would do so would determine how strongly pro-cyclical money supply would be. When we look at the data, we actually find that money supply is pro-cyclical as predicted by the model, but weakly so, which means, as we had observed before, that the European Central Bank has not pursued a monetary policy that completely eliminated the counter-cyclicality in the price level. 